Welcome to Aging in Style with me, Lori Williams. I'm an optimist by nature, and I believe you can follow your dreams at any age. My grandmother's journey with dementia ignited a passion in me to work with seniors. I've spent the past 13 years learning about seniors and aging. In my mid-50s, I followed my own dream and founded my company, where I use my expertise to help seniors locate housing and resources. On this podcast, we cover all aspects of aging. Join us each week to meet senior living experts and inspirational seniors who are following their dreams. The fact is, we're all aging, so why not do it in style? Hi, welcome to another episode of Aging in Style with Lori Williams. A couple of years ago, or right before COVID started, I had gone to an event and I heard a gentleman speak about an organization he was part of called the Coalition for Aging LGBT. And I was pretty amazed by what he said and kind of shocked that in my 14 years of working in senior living, it had never really come up to me about LGBT and senior living. And so this organization really piqued my interest. And you know what they do, they have a senior housing guide that are LGBT friendly communities. And we're going to speak with two of their head people of the Coalition for Aging LGBT today on to, on this podcast. I was looking on their website, and one thing that it said was, according to the latest U.S. Census, there are an estimated 194,451 members of the lesbian and gay community aged 45 to 90 plus living in the four largest counties of North Texas. So that's if you live here in this area, it's Dallas, Tarrant, Collin, and Denton counties. And according to the census, 27% of all people aged 65 plus live alone. And many programs have been developed for non-LGBT aging citizens However, access to these programs for LGBT citizens can be a challenge because of continued discrimination. And so that's what we're going to discuss today. We're going to talk about this program. We're going to talk about our aging seniors who are LGBT. And we're going to talk about what kind of things communities can do to be more aware and um, a better place to be for our LGBT families. So our guests today are Robert Emery, and he co-founded the Coalition for Aging LGBT, which provides support and advocacy for seniors in North Texas, and he currently serves as the treasurer. Robert is a founding member of the Dallas Way, which is a GLBT history project, which works to gather, organize, store, and present the complete GLBT history of Dallas, Texas. He's a very busy civic volunteer with over 40 years, and he has served as the board of directors of Black Tie Dinner and Friends of WRR, Dallas Classical Music Radio. And then our other guest is Dr. Diane Thornton. She is the executive director of the Coalition for Aging LGBT. Diane is a retired school superintendent and past CEO president of the nonprofit. She is very passionate about working with the community to help make a difference. She holds a doctorate with an emphasis in educational leadership, and Diane volunteers as an advocate for CASA of Dallas and is an active board member on her son's school advisory board. Diane's love for her family is one that is shared with her wife and son, and they have been active in the LGBTQ community for many years and believe in the importance of awareness, support, and compassion for the everyday mission to allow for a safe, fair environment for all. That's beautiful. So welcome to both of you. Welcome, Robert, and welcome, Diane. I'm so glad that you agreed to be guests today, and I can't wait to hear more about the Coalition for Aging. Why don't we start with you, Robert, and can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to work in this capacity with seniors? Yes, the the lives that LGBT citizens in general live in America now is better than it was 50 years ago. But many of us are very conscious of the fact that the rights and privileges we enjoy today were brought to us by the people who are now currently 80 years old Mm -hmm. and 90 years old. They were a generation that was pursued relentlessly, thrown out of jobs, thrown out of clubs, 
thrown out of their communities, thrown out of their families, and they need our support. They need our caring and they need our advocacy. Absolutely. And Diane? First of all, I am, it's just an absolute honor that I have the privilege to work with, with the Coalition for Aging LGBT um, because there are so many of our community members out there who are, in my opinion, afraid. And I feel that some of them uh, possibly have even gone back into the closet um, because of that fear. And, and if they're living in an assisted living uh, or a senior home, and it means a great deal to me because I want to help. I want to help to provide with our organization the resources necessary for those individuals within our communities that are spread out across those four counties. Absolutely. And um, when I spoke with DR, who works with y'all earlier, I spoke with him a few weeks ago about this, and he said to me, and it has stayed with me, he said that there are so many people who fought for all the rights, and they've now had to go back into the closet because they're afraid of how they'll be treated. And that is that's not okay. That is awful. And when he told me that, that just really, I mean, it just, I mean, literally just hurt my heart to hear my 25 year old son is gay. And for him, you know, I, I see things are so much better now, but it just breaks my heart to think of, you know, that these things are still happening in 2021. So tell us about the Coalition for Aging, how it was started, just, you know, when it began, just kind of the history of it, please. In 2011, our founder was invited to the Obama White House for a meeting uh, focused on aging in America. Uh, He was one of the few LGBT representatives in the room. And he got a lot of encouragement from people in the room saying, uh, you should go back and focus on your LGBT seniors. He returned to Dallas. He did some research. He found that there were 200,000 LGBT seniors living in the four counties that make up North Texas. So we were off and running with that inspiration. Wonderful. Tell me a little about what you do, how you support and, and the services that you provide. Well, first, let's back up to how we even named what those needs were. Mm -hmm. We put out a survey in 2013 to our community and we asked them what their concerns were. And what we got back was 95% of them said their number one concern was housing. Hmm. Could they age in place in their home and have home health care come in? Would they be treated fairly in their own homes or If they needed to go to a community, would they be welcome there? That was their number one concern. Beyond that, the coalition advocates of of legally and legislatively. We advocate, we study um, health issues, financial security. So we have a lot of different areas such as those. Okay, wonderful. Um, Now, I know that you put out a guide, the Senior Housing Guide, and I've actually picked one up. It's probably been a couple of years because I had met someone a couple of years ago or right before COVID, and there was a guide. I believe, if I understand correctly, y'all had gone around and surveyed different assisted livings. Is that correct? Yes. When First of all, we did some in-person anecdotal research. We walked into communities and said, Hi, I'm looking for a place for my mother and her wife. Uh, Do you have a place for them here? And always 100% of the time, the answer was an enthusiastic yes. We'd love to have your mother and her wife here. But ask one more question, one layer deeper, which is, do you have any programs specifically for them? Uh, Is there any education? What is your corporate stance? Uh, do you offer same-sex benefits and marriage benefits and health benefits to your same-sex co- uh, employees and their spouses? That's when you find out that 99% of them are unprepared, and the answer is no. But 
we don't stop there because they're very, very anxious and excited to be brought up to cultural competency. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they've failed the test originally is not important. What we found encouraging is that so many of them want to learn. And so we created a metric, a questionnaire that listed very specific things that if they did all of these things, then we would list them on our website in our North Texas LGBT friendly senior housing guide. What were some of the things that they, they do? Just if you name a few of them off for the metrics. Oh, sure. On your entry form, when it has a marital status, do you have, everyone has married, single, divorced? Well, we ask them to put partnered because so many of our seniors who are 80 and 90 years old may have spent 40 or 50 years with a partner but they were not allowed to marry. And so they walk in there with a lifetime of partnership and and marriage uh, informally, we could call mm-hmm. it that, but there's no place on the form that actually fits what they are. And the beautiful thing about what we ask communities to do is it's very easy to say partnered. It's very easy to add that to your entry form. We're not asking for much, but what we are asking is for the implicit to become the explicit. The other interesting one is gender, you know, a male and female. And we ask, how about prefer not to say or ask me later mm-hmm. so that we make people comfortable. And uh, that's, that's just two of the small things um, we've added. We all know that there is a national standard for a non-discrimination statement that Mm -hmm. corporations live by, but we ask them to add sexual orientation and gender identity to that long list of age, color, creed, et cetera, that already exists. It's things that all of our communities are very happy to add. They're easy to add. But when one of our members of our community walks into a retirement facility, or a home health care company, and they see that form that says married, single, divorced, partnered, they know right off that these people have done their homework. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's good to know. What about like programming? Do you give them ideas and have some of the communities embrace programming? Well, they all have to embrace programming if they want to be in our housing guide, and many of them are. We will provide the programming, we'll provide the program, or we give them a very simple guideline, such as, here's a simple one. We know you all have movie night, and we know you sometimes discuss the movies after you have them. Would you please show a movie such as the uh, Marigold Hotel? Mm -hmm. Because it has a very gay positive character in it. And we ask that when the movie's over, would you ask for a show of hands? Who has somebody in their life that they love who's LGBT? And you won't get very many hands raised, but we work with communities over the course of six months. And Mm -hmm. through that six months, we're giving training to the employees, everyone from the president to the caregivers, to the cafeteria staff, to the janitors and the uh, groundskeepers. Everyone gets the same training. Mm -hmm. And if you ask who has someone in their lives that they love who's LGBT. If you ask that when we first walk in the building, you'll get a shy single person who'll raise their hand. After six months, almost everyone raises their hand. Yeah. It's not that they didn't know them six months ago. They did not know it was okay to say it six months ago. And a nice byproduct of our work is that when we visit these communities later, a year later, they will report to us with a beaming smile on their face that due to our involvement with them and our training, the entire work environment is greatly improved. That's great. I mean, I think it just what you're doing, it opens communication is what it sounds like. It really makes people talk and and know that it's okay to uh, to talk about and for that older generation. They may not have been comfortable talking about LGBT. 
No, they, a lot of them spent their Mm -hmm. lives in the closet, even though they were out on the front lines working for equality, they Mm -hmm. still lived closeted in their jobs, in their homes sometimes. But this is a great time for us to turn to Diane because she has a very compelling story about why she's involved. Okay. Sure. Um, Well, I'm involved, first of all, because I care about our community, but also we want to talk about closeted. I have been closeted all my life, and it wasn't until um, my wife and I married in 2013 that I was able to come out fully to my family, and so, and that's a long time, Yeah, and it is the greatest feeling that I have that, and, and this inspires me, and having this opportunity to be the first executive director inspired me because I really feel it it just opens up your heart to the, the possibilities. And so that that's why, you know, this is so important to me because I know what it feels like to sit in a room where it is spoken in a very negative manner regarding the LGBT community, whether it's youth or seniors. And um, I have bitten my tongue most of my life. And now it's it's a reward to me to be able now to give back and feel so great that I get to include my family, my wife, and my son. That is a wonderful story. I love that. Wonderful testimonial. And I mean, I feel like, you know, when you say that, I just picture these people in their 80s. How awful to have to feel like they can't be who they are and be, especially feel like they're having to, I mean, that's hiding your a whole, I don't know, like a major part of your life, not to be able to be who you are. And as you said, sit in a room and hear negative things said. And I would imagine that probably still happens with the older generation. So I think to bring in, positivity and education into these communities, I think is a brilliant idea. Yeah. Do you, what kind of discrimination are the seniors or what kind of things are happening with them? Is it the caregivers or is it other seniors? What happens in the communities or in home care if they have someone come into their home to care for them? Much of it is unintentional. Mm -hmm. LGBT people in America suffer many microaggressions throughout the day from people who don't even know what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. They, they, they don't mean, they don't mean to hurt. It still hurts. For instance, here's, here's a great example. Uh, someone may say in a very sweet tone to a senior in, in their retirement community that they respect their choice being LGBT. I support you. I support your choice. And many of your listeners may not have figured out yet what part of that sentence is hurtful. So let me tell you that choice is a hurtful concept. Nobody chose to be LGBT. And it's hurtful because the word choice is still weaponized against us from the people who perpetuate the lie that it is a choice. And so the word choice is used often in anti-LGBT language. There's a, there's a tiny microaggression that was unintentional. So we, we talk about this and it's part of the training. Uh, they also, uh, when you have somebody that you're not sure what their gender is, if the question is not so much, what are you? Who are you? But the friendly way to say that is, Tell me what pronouns you prefer. And that question speaks volumes to your awareness. So when we teach this and they learn it and they put it into practice, their lives open up. Everyone's lives open up when you learn those small things. Mm-hmm. That's that's great. And I can see, I, I've heard people say that so many times that, and they think they're giving a compliment and do refer to the word choice. And so I think that is, I, I think it's a lot about awareness and education from what I'm, what I'm hearing you say, when you go in, it's just to make 
them aware that, you know, maybe they, they're not meaning to be hurtful. Maybe some people are, but many are not trying to be hurtful. So I think it's so important to make these things, these microaggressions, as you said, make people aware of them. I know there are some places. Oh, go ahead. I'm giggling because I was at a party last week mm-hmm. uh, and I was speaking to a lady that I know, she's a lovely lady, and she wanted me to know, I suppose, that she accepts me. So she opened up about her grandson who is gay. And when she did that, she said, but I guess, you know, it could be worse. He could be a drug addict. Oh. (laughs) And I thought, well, okay, I know I know you're trying to be positive. I know you. I know you're trying to be positive, but wow, do you have any idea? And that's what I'm talking about that we uh, live with all the time. Good intentioned people, Mm -hmm. but wow. Yeah. It's kind of like really stop and think that through before you say something, right? Right. Would you please? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. definitely. Oh my goodness. So, um, there are some places, I, you know, I've read about in Arizona that have started communities that are LGBT only and in California. And I actually had lunch with a gentleman today who owns care homes here in Dallas. And uh, we were talking about, I was telling about the podcast and he said, well, you know, my son is gay and I have been thinking about starting a care home that is only for LGBTQ. And I'm like, that's amazing. So, right. So I, uh, I told him I'm going to send him this podcast, <laughs> make sure he listens to it. Okay. I, based on our 2013 survey, we found out something that will surprise you. LGBT people by and large, 92% have no interest in being in a community that is exclusively LGBT. Really? Interesting. Now, that surpri- yes, that surprises us a lot because there's lots of conversation among LGBT people that that's what they want. They want an LGBT. But when we burrowed down deeper, the, the refined language and the semantics is actually what they want is to live in the world but they want the world to be culturally competent. So your friend has the right idea. If he were to go after that market, it's there and it's wanting. His prospective clients would not be as interested if there weren't some variety. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But to go from that beginning is the perfect place. Let's, yeah. let's go from LGBT friendly or LGBT predominantly And let's put it this way, too. Anecdotally, I'll tell you that I have so many friends, allies, who have said, if you will build an LGBT exclusive, I want to live there. That's where I want to go. Mm -hmm. I want to be with y'all. So I would say to your friend, uh, go for it, sir. But then also realize that the variety is the spice of life. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. So I always like to ask people, and as we're concluding, is there a senior in your life that inspired you? Someone you can think of that that really was an inspiration to you? Diane? For me, uh, it was my father. My father um, was, he grew up as an orphan his entire life. His parents died at a very young age. And so I would have to tell you that he was the greatest inspiration to me just because he became successful and he saw what he could do and he saw what he wanted for his children because I came from a family of six children. So I would have to tell you that um, it was my father. Wonderful. And I know we were talking earlier and you shared that your father was in assisted living and yes. that, you know, for you, it was a different experience going into assisted living for him. If you want to share with us about that, that would be great. Sure. Um, You know, there was never a question going into the assisted living uh, place where he lived. I never doubted for a minute that he wasn't treated with anything but respect. He got the greatest care. But also, Lori, what I did find out very quickly, how accepting they were of my wife and me, because she did go with me uh, to visit him. And then when our son was born in 2014, Uh, We had the opportunity to take him over uh, after about six weeks old. 
and the staff was very accepting. And so that made me feel very good that I knew he was in the right place. That's great. So, I mean, what I've learned by talking to both of you today, it sounds like that there is a lot of people who are accepting in the assisted living and, and senior living want to do the right thing, but maybe we need a little education along the way and make a few changes just to make things, you know, more friendly. Would y'all agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. So is there anyone, Robert, uh, that stands out as an inspirational senior for you? I could list individuals such as Jack Evans and George Harris and Mike Anglin and Carl Parker. And the list is very long of people, but here's why I believe I was lucky. I started activism in the community when I was very young and worked with people who were a generation older than I, and they were my absolute heroes. So I can't say one person, I can say that the that the gay men and women who I saw as role models when I was young are an inspiration to me now. And I wanna make it good for them, as good for them as I can. And Lori, I'll also say that what, what, what Diane touched on, the work we do is not just for the residents who are going to move in to these communities, but they possibly their LGBT children. Mm-hmm. And that's where that's where I can relate to my mother being uh, in the community and how was I treated? So it would have been nice in the place where she was, which was the best in town, but they were not very evolved on the gay thing. And what I mean by that is there were gay people working everywhere in that place and all of them were closeted. Hmm. And that's not that's not helpful no. for anyone. Uh, my favorite story is that the director of activities was married to the director of nursing and they were closeted. Now, they weren't closeted in their home, mm-hmm. but they, they had been closeted at work. That's, that's not helpful. No. They were two magnificent people that should have brought their entire selves to their jobs. It would have been better for everybody. So um, we're still working on getting into that community. Mm hmm. Well, wonderful. I know that you'll get in. (laughs) So I appreciate you both being on the podcast and sharing all your information. And we're going to share your website. And can people still get the senior housing guide? Is there a way if someone in Dallas wanted to get a copy of the guide? Oh, most certainly. You just visit us on the web at cfa.lgbt. And the housing guide is one of the first things that comes up on our homepage. Wonderful. And a lot of senior communities, um, people listen to this podcast. And if they want to reach out to you, (laughs) just go to the website or what would be the best way? Exactly. And we have a place for a contact us and you let us know. The great good news is that since COVID, of course, we have not been able to set foot on any campuses. But I'm thrilled to tell you that communities have reached out to us as COVID began to wind down saying, okay, we want to be in your next guide. So I love that you mentioned that because I believe that your listeners who are in that business, we'd love for them to go to our website and use the contact us spot and let us know that you'd like for us to come see you. We will come see you. Wonderful. And when is your next guide coming out? Do you have one scheduled? We don't have one scheduled for print because Mm -hmm. we're going to focus on updating them online so that we can add somebody immediately. Mm -hmm. If we wait till printing, then we have to wait for a lot of people who are anxious. They want to be listed as soon as possible. So we're doing a whole lot of focus on the online. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I It was such a pleasure getting to talk to both of you. And I know this is going to be a really good show. I know people are going to enjoy listening to this and, and learn something from it. And as always, thank you for listening to the podcast. And if you have questions or need additional resources, you can always visit my website, which is lauriewilliams-seniorservices.com. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.